Namaste and welcome to this, the um, fourth part in the series, Understanding Bhakti, the culmination of yoga. I would just like to make the point, if you would allow me, that this conversation that we are having, this series of talks, is introductory. There is a combination of um, introductory spiritual ideas and understandings, but we're also doing, we're also dealing with um, profound and very deep spiritual truth, which is not possible to actually fully understand and appreciate on the mental platform. All yoga is about spiritual experience and realization. It's not about mental understanding. That is a wrong idea if somebody has it. And for one to experience the different forms of realization and have the different spiritual experiences, one does need to walk on this path, the spiritual path that brings one to these um, experiences and realizations. So I just wanted to um, we're not dealing with some of the topics in a, in a very deep way. I'm simply introducing some of these ideas and for the purpose of trying to provide a broader or more complete understanding, we are touching on even quite advanced spiritual topics or points without going into detail about them. Hopefully, what will occur for some people who perhaps watch this for the first time is they may become inspired to themselves travel on the spiritual path and to have this awakening, this spiritual experience, the awakening of actual love for God. So, Today, what I was going to speak on is the different flavors of love. I think there's a famous English sonnet. How many ways do I love thee? Let me count the ways. That is a reflection, an imperfect reflection of a spiritual reality. As a child growing up and my experiences with Christianity, for instance, made it so that I and many of the people around me had a rather monochromatic view of a relationship with God was monotone. It was just like one, one flavor, one tone, and that was it. And when I first encountered my spiritual master, or both of my spiritual masters, it was like an eruption of flavor and color. I was shown that the different moods and experiences of love for God, it's just like it is 
practically speaking, limitless. And there is a great science to the process or the undertaking of bhakti in its early stages and its development and how love for God is manifest and the nature of relationships and and moods of love that one can exchange with God. So, but a person may ask, well, if, if loving God or love for God is, is actually in my best interest, why does God not just kind of, you know, come along and, and, and give everybody that experience? Why does he allow people to wander in the material world and go through so much suffering and difficulty? Why doesn't he just kind of like show himself or show up or, or just give us this experience? And while that is a common question, what it is not addressing is a really fundamental spiritual reality. And it has to do with the question of free will. Now, the the Vedic perspective is that I am, meaning I, the living being, the spiritual being, am a part and parcel, like an independent particle of God. So in a similar way that I could take a drop of water from the ocean and it contains all of the qualities or the characteristics of the water in the ocean in terms of quality, but not of quantity. In the same manner, you and I, the spiritual living beings, we are not created. We have existed eternally as eternal parts and parcels of God. The nature of God is, of course, to supremely possess free will. And therefore, it is part of our nature to also have free will. And out of love and enormous respect for the living being, God actually does not interfere with the free will of any living being. You are free to do anything you wish, to think and say, to believe or accept anything that you wish. The reality is, though, that in the material world, there are consequences to all choices. It's not a question of do something good and get a, get a mm, sweet, a treat, do something bad and get punished or get a slap on the hand. No, it's not like that. It is just part of the natural balance, the laws of nature, that when we behave in a certain way, there will be a reaction to that. And we must accept the fruits or the results of all of our actions. That is just part of living and existing within the material world. And it, you know, while we can learn from the experiences in the material world, there is no point where we lose freedom of will. So there is this oneness, our oneness with God, and yet simultaneous difference or distinction, in that we are qualitatively the same, but quantitatively there is a vast difference. This question of free will and what I brought up, you know, this fact that God does not force himself upon anyone. That is not his nature. And that is not the way that, if I can say, he, he operates. In the question of love, for love to exist, there is this fundamental requirement for free will. 
love, in fact, is the ultimate manifestation of free will. And so this free will is like plays a, an extremely significant and important or it, ha it, 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 it has a great significance rather um, to the path of God realization and self realization. Having said that, we then must consider what is it that I need to do to make it so that this love, which we discussed in the last talk, which resides eternally within my heart, can begin to manifest. Our, you know, from the yogic perspective, our state of consciousness, the state that we are living in, the things that we are holding to be either true or important, the focus of our life, our consciousness is a practical expression of our free will. We make choices, choices to engage in certain type of activities. You know, all of these things are intimately connected, just to, to make it clear. If, if I gravitate towards a certain t group of people that have certain likes, and I spend enough time with them, soon the likes of that group invariably become my likes, even though some of the things that they're engaged in in the beginning didn't seem like a big deal to me and I wasn't very attracted to. Just by persistent exposure, over time, I develop a taste. They say this, you develop a taste for something. Our activities and the way we live our life profoundly affects our consciousness. And our consciousness is what is going to determine how we see this world, how we see ourselves, how we see others, and how we will see God. The process of yoga is a process where people by different methods or by different undertakings, by different practices, will seek to become free from the influence of different states of consciousness. To become, to have this veil or this filter removed so my real nature can begin to manifest. With relation to love and love for God, this is also a really significant thing to, to understand and appreciate. There is one wonderful verse um, from a source, uh, this book is known as the Brahma Samhita, where this prayer, it says, I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Shama Sundar, Krishna himself, with inconceivable, innumerable, attributes, whom the great or pure devotees see in their heart of hearts with eyes of devotion tinged with the self of love. What this verse speaks to is we will see things, we will adopt as truth, we will be attracted to certain types of so-called happiness based upon our own consciousness. This consciousness is an expression of free will. 
So um, th there's another verse in the, in the Bhagavad Gita that really speaks to this also in a wonderful way. Um, it's in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And in this verse it says, As all surrender unto me, and this is Lord Krishna speaking, as all surrender unto me, I reward accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Purita. So the statement here makes it very clear that the material world operates under certain rules, within certain parameters. The spiritual dimension operates with other spiritual rules and under the other spiritual parameters. And a, nobody can escape the control of Ishwara, the Supreme Controller. Things are organized in a specific way. This is just part of a reality. It doesn't matter where you go, you cannot escape what we've discussed as being your natural position, as being a dominated part and parcel of God. You are not supreme. I'm sorry, that might be rather sad for some people, but that's just a fundamental reality. That is your natural position to be dominated part and parcel of the supreme. That being the case, it doesn't matter whether I am trying to function or operate or exist within the spiritual dimensional realm or the material dimensional realm, my position is still going to be the same. And in different places, I will be, I will be under the control of different laws. You have the material laws, and within the spiritual realm, they are what I will refer to as laws of love, which are, uh, it's, this principle is just truly amazing and, and absolutely wonderful. So in this verse, Krishna had said I, that as all surrender unto me, and it's like, well, I haven't surrendered to Krishna. Well, no, you may not have surrendered your will to his, seeking to dovetail it. You may be seeking to be supremely independent. And therefore, you will end up surrendering to Krishna's energy, the material energy and the illusory energy. And you will exist within the material world, surrendered to the notion that I am this body, that I can find peace and happiness, love, fulfillment. This is my home. And you're completely surrendered to that idea. And it's just not true. It's just not true. But surrender we must. Dovetailing our will, we must do. We don't have a choice. Our choice is though whether I dovetail my will with Krishna's illusory or God's illusory energy, the material creation, or with him in that spiritual dimension. And according to how I am surrendering, how I am dovetailing my will, there will be a corresponding type of reward. The reward of the existence in the material world always ends with some bitterness. And the spiritual reward is always transcendentally pleasing. If someone goes, well, that's not fair. Well, it's not a question of fairness. <laughs> it's just a question of reality. It's like saying, if I hit myself, my hand with a hammer, and it's painful, but that's not fair. It's like, you know, what? You expect to be able to hit your hand with a hammer and not experience pain? No, just because you think that that's not fair 
is irrelevant. This is just the nature of things. So when I become absorbed in, in materialistic idea and consciousness, I seek to be the center of my world. I want to be like a mini God. Everything revolves around me and the way I see it. There will be a consequence to that. And unfortunately, it is unpleasant. And when one voluntarily surrenders, spiritually and seeks to dovetail their will with the will of God, that becomes a transcendentally enlivening, a profoundly ecstatically joyful experience. This is just fundamental truth. So if one wants to have an intimate connection with God, if one wants to have a very profoundly personal and loving relationship, it is necessary to give up certain types of covering or consciousness, things which keep us away from this experience, that keep us away from God. And the process of bhakti, which I will speak a little bit more about maybe in the next talk, is a process by which this transformation as a result of a purification can take place. Moving on to then, you know, how we express um, an attraction for a connection with God and the fact that he rewards according to how we are surrendering. In other words, we end up determining what our experience with God is going to be like. He responds to our lead. He is already exerting an influence like a magnet draws iron filings towards it. The Lord of our heart is drawing us, beckoning, and we feel drawn. That is why everybody wants to love and to be loved. This is part of the natural drawing power of God. That is why this feeling and desire exists. This is why it is part of our nature. He is drawing and attracting us. But we are given unlimited opportunity to express our free will. And according to how we seek to love and to serve God, he will respond. So when a person describes the, this earlier verse that we read, you know, described a, a, um, a spiritual vision of being able to not figuratively, but actually see this Lord of our heart, within our heart of hearts, when one's spiritual eye is coated with the salve of love, when one's eye is tinged with the salve of love, one will be able to see or experience an amazing intimacy with God. Now, in the Vedas, they speak about the Supreme Personality of Godhead Bhagavan as having two principal features. One, th this is called um, Ashvarya, and the other one is Madhurya. The first refers to God's manifestation in great opulence and majesty where when someone begins to have this realization and is draws close to and is able to experience and see the reality of God, they see him through, I will say, a filter where they perceive his unlimited opulence and great majesty. When a yogi or a spiritualist has a connection with God in this way, 
there is always the feeling of great awe and reverence. There is this constant awareness of like, da -na -na -na, God. <laughs> you know, I am in the presence of God. It is overwhelmingly filled with awe, reverence, great majesty and opulence. But the Vedas also speak about something that is considered more confidential and more amazing. There is a feature to God, this personality, Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, where sweetness becomes the overwhelming experience. And in that condition, when one relates in this way towards God, one becomes lost in an experience of such profound love, there is no awareness of him as being God. People sometimes, you know, struggle with this, um, with this spiritual truth. And an example can be given that in this world, if you have a monarch, we don't have very many of them around, still a few, where you've got you know, a king or a queen who exists in a great palace, or the president of a country who lives in some presidential building, you know, White House or White Hall or whatever people call things. And you have all of the trappings of, of power. If an ambassador from another country or even, even probably a better example, a common person is brought into one of these buildings and they are to meet a president or a king or a queen, there is this like, whoa, you know, and everybody's like on best behavior, a little bit nervous and, you know, bowing appropriately or, you know, being extremely polite and being very aware of things. At that same moment that someone is treating someone who is sitting in a seat of power, the son or daughter, a little child of that president or king or queen comes running into the room. They don't even see all of the power. They don't feel any fearfulness. They will shout out, you know, daddy, you know, and just run and jump into his arms. This is like, or can be used as an example of the difference between these two different types of spiritual experience and relationship with God. When a person is relating to God in this majesty and awe, in the Vedas, this aspect of God is addressed as either Vishnu or Narayana, by these names. They address this feature of God, this manifestation or expansion of God in this feature. When an individual is able to experience, become immersed in such a mood of love, then this feature of God is known differently. So in the Bhagavad Purana, it speaks about this personality, one of the names, and there are unlimited names that are used to address God in this most original feature. But one very wonderful and attractive name is Krishna. Krishna literally means, these two syllables, Krishna, literally means the all-attractive. 
You know, we see that in this world people are generally attracted to opulence. Like this name Bhagavan, Bhaga. Bhag means opulence. And when you say van, it means one who is exhibiting or manifesting these opulences. And the great teachers have categorized these specific opulences such as wealth, fame, power, etc. But one of these opulences is beauty, limitless beauty, stunning beauty, ecstatic beauty. And Krishna, this name, refers to this manifestation, the original feature of God, as being unlimitedly attractive, ecstatically beautiful, and the fountainhead of all love. This alone is already a very big subject, but just I will try to add a little bit to that. Within the Vedas, the confidential parts of the Vedas, it speaks about this form of Krishna, the all-attractive feature of God, the personality of Godhead. And it speaks about different varieties of loving exchanges that one can have with God. They are five primary categories of loving exchange with an infinite number of variations underneath it. The characteristics of this love, though, that one experiences with Krishna, where there is no awareness of him being God, there is that thought doesn't even exist. In fact, that thought or, or understanding or appreciation would get in the way of and block the natural outflow of love. So one of the characteristics of these uh, five varieties of love that begin with what's called neutrality and then servitorship and then uh, intimate friendship and parental love and then the lover uh, the lover and beloved relationship or conjugal relationship is that as the love becomes experienced in a more profound way, the relationship between the individual soul and the Supreme Soul or God begins to change. In the initial experiences or relationships that one can experience with God, one, while they don't see him as God, still tend to look up to him. And there may be a feeling of great intimacy where I am, I am a servant of God. Not in the idea that, you know, he is big and powerful or anything, but my position has been lower than him and is a servant. These relationships can mature to a position of friendship where one is loving God and relating to him as an equal. One needs to have this growth and development to become increasingly immersed in these mo modes or moods of love. There is also a parental relationship where a person, unlike what was expressed by Lord Jesus Christ, where he looked upon God as being his father. We now have a role reversal, where a person can love God in the mood 
of love that a parent feels towards a child, where the position is one of a superior, that I must love and protect my child. If I do not do this, something bad might happen to them. I'm ex trying to explain it this way just so we can perhaps have some glimpse of understanding. And what we see in, in the more confidential parts of the Vedas are descriptions of the nature of these relationships within the spiritual world. There is an account in the Bhagavad Purana and in many other Vedic scriptures of how God periodically may, if I can use the term, incarnate or descend to this world for the purpose of reclaiming the lost souls. And that action of reclaiming is done by throwing open like a window to the spiritual world where one becomes intensely attracted and drawn to the nature of these loving exchanges. And this awakens our eternal serving and loving mood. In the Bhagavad Purana, in one part of it, the 10th Kanto, there are wonderful accounts of how Krishna related to his intimate lovers. These relationships of love are referred to as pastimes of the Lord, his leela, his playful and loving activity. And if someone would like to have a more intimate look into the nature of the eternal spiritual world where the flavor of love overrides any thought of majesty and opulence or that this is God, then they could seek to perhaps read the, um, a book that was published by Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. It is called Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And I think this is also even available um, online. And what this is, is like a summary study, an account of this particular portion of this Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavat Purana that speaks about the nature of these relationships that one is able to um, develop and experience with God. This, this is a full and mature manifestation of bhakti. This spiritual, not just realization, in, in, I won't use the word realization, it's, it's an appropriate word, but people sometimes have a concept of what realization is. You know, it is an experience, an experience of a full awakening of one's natural love for God. And it is unlike any other religious experience or things associated with religious faith. It is a profoundly, I would have to address it as being mystical and spiritual experience that is only available to the topmost of yogis. Topmost of yogis, not meaning the most accomplished, the gold medalists. It is going the other way. Those who have become so profoundly humble and have entered a world of great submissiveness of heart and profound humility that they will have this experience and realization under the appropriate guidance of a qualified spiritual master who is himself 
a topmost lover of God. So this is a very <clears throat> big subject, and this is only an introduction. Of course, it's, I find it quite difficult how to introduce and not get into too much detail or complication. But at the same time, adequately share with you this great spiritual treasure. And I recognize my tremendous deficiencies in this. And I hope you will forgive me for my deficiencies. But please do consider carefully the points that we are going over. And we will still, more points that we will um, discuss going forward. And my hope is that people will be able to more appropriately understand and appreciate what is bhakti. Thank you very much and um, invite you once again to um, join, uh, join us in um, uh, Kirtan meditation. Again, we'll use that um, same mantra as last time, Gopala Govindarama Madana Mohana. Go. Oh.